So hi everyone, um, this is UCL Artificial Intelligence Society and welcome. Um, my name's Joy, I'm the head of content here and today we have a very special guest. We have Piotr who is going to give a quick presentation about his PhD and his work research. So um, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, sure, hi, thanks for, friends. Thanks for having me. Uh, I hope I won't, well, I won't bore you with what I'm doing. I think it's sure pretty, not. Uh, <laughs> pretty, uh, pretty interesting and, uh, and exciting, especially when we talk about uh, applying artificial intelligence solutions to finance. Uh, so uh, regarding introductions, uh, let me just, yeah. Uh, so briefly, um, I'm currently a part-time PhD uh, candidate in computer science at UCL. Uh, although my actually bachelor's and master's in, in, is in economics and finance, so I'm sort of like a hybrid, hence, yeah, applying machine learning to finance, which is like a perfect symbiosis, I guess. Uh, apart from that, I'm a, a CFA charter holder since 2019 uh and uh that's pretty much it regarding my education work-wise i'm currently a senior uh quant at uh, church commissioners for england and i know it sounds a bit odd but uh in fact we kind of start to getting more complex with um uh, modern quantitative analysis in, in the church uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's pretty exciting. Generally church commissioners for England is an, uh, uh, endowment fund It's one of the wealthiest charitable organizations in the world, currently around $10 billion, uh, in, uh, assets, uh, under management and, uh, uh, yeah, we, we are not just helping the church, we also help other uh, uh, institutions. So we like distribute, donate uh, uh, institutions in need. So there is a double responsibility. So we, not only we have to actually make money, but we also, a lot of people rely on us. So we have to be super careful. Um, previously, I was a senior quant uh, in, um, in a research firm that was in Poland, but I had an opportunity to work with uh, uh, one of the largest U.S. investment bank, both in London and New York, where I pretty much learned all the stuff that I'm doing nowadays. Um, and uh, yeah, apart from that, I'm a mentor for um, uh, well, students or even my colleagues, whoever is in fact interested in financial machine learning would like to make these first steps because especially students, I, I work with some brilliant mathematicians way smarter than me, but they have no idea about machine learning or just machine learning finance. So I, I'm happy to help them. And privately, um, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, worked in Poland because I was, uh, I, uh, I was born and then raised in Poland. I currently reside in London with my family. Uh, I have two little girls and thank God Boris Johnson did not close kindergartens. <laughs> <laughs> no, so that actually we can have this conversation in peace because my wife took the younger daughter uh, away and the other is in kindergarten. And my interests apart from finance and AI, uh, I really, well, I re really like video games, single player video games, generally computers, but also uh, I'm passionate about astronomy, history and football. Uh, so yeah, um, that's pretty much about me. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to actually share uh well a bit depends if a bit or not but my about my phd first which is actually focused on detecting and pre predicting regime switches in in finance yeah so for those who are actually not very knowledgeable in finance um could you briefly ex explain what a financial regime is and especially why it's important um with regards to machine learning uh, sure. So uh, financial regime is like a, a super significant component of financial times, not only financial time series, of time series. It's just uh, uh, the thing is that the whatever time series this, in this case finance, it has some periods that actually differ with each other uh, in asset uh, 
returns, volatility, and correlations. In fact, you can even see on the uh, chart here, uh, where I use model I'll talk about in a, in a second, which shows you these regimes. In this case, we have low variance regime and high variance. So it's clear, let's say low variance regime is this kind of a calm, ever rising, slowly growing uh, regime where uh, pretty much everyone is happy. Uh, asset, assets generate higher re returns. Uh, they are a bit less correlated with each other. Whereas the red is where pretty much everything goes bust, people panic. Um, at least on, in, in this picture, people panic, returns are low, volatility skyrockets, uh, and actually co asset correlation is getting higher because during these periods, if investors sell, they literally sell everything. And sometimes they even just want cash, like in fact happened uh, lately in, in March, 2020. Uh, and from not only machine learning perspective, but from asset management perspective, uh, they are important to actually um, detect, to so even predict so that you, an asset manager, whoever that is, uh, is able to adjust portfolio weights and be ready for them. So uh, say, well, if you're kind of in the beginning of the green period here, obviously you would like to move a lot of stuff, your money to more risky assets because they tend to make you more money. But when you're getting closer to the peak, you would like to actually move back from risky asset to so-called safe havens, such as some developed countries bonds or gold or even some um, 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 currencies like uh, Japanese yen, Swiss franc, uh, because they kind of have this money, say money parking effect, or you just do not lose that much, sometimes even earn money where everything else um, uh, goes down. And hence, this is super important because if uh, you kind of, you don't care and you <laughs> just uh, follow, sometimes even you follow those, mod, uh, those uh, classic portfolio theories, uh, you may in fact uh, lose more than, uh, than you should. And uh, generally this regime switching area of research is getting, uh, has been getting uh, more and more attention since 90s, uh, pretty much. Okay. And yeah, this is so, what I studied. Yeah. That's really cool. So um, just as a concrete example, um, I can see on the graph, like the 2008 financial crisis, like it goes into very high variance. So would that be an example of when machine learning would have been really beneficial to um, kind of, I guess, reduce the losses that most people um, suffered throughout that crisis? Uh, so as long as it's set on sort of predicting it, this is what I want to do, because generally what we have now in research are these amazing models. They are called Markov switching regressions. It's melody of the 70s even. And uh, they've been really solid regarding detecting those. So pretty much they say, what's the probability of um, certain state whether low variance or high, high variance uh, being persistent over next step. But they pretty much tell you uh, like the current situation. This is sort of now casting. And what I want to do is to actually predict them ahead. Mm -hmm. So uh, to put it into example, my, uh, Markov switching regression here would tell me, right, all right, we're in red. That's cool because, but everyone knows it. I mean, so, it's better if somebody would tell me here that we are heading into red. And this is what machine learning can help you with, because obviously you want to predict something uh, with these models in, in advance, something that Markov switching regression, for instance, uh, is not capable of in the same magnitude. Um, and that's why it's, uh, uh, it's super useful, but then again, super difficult. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, whoever manages to do it will be really rich. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, generally, this is how it works in finance. Uh, whoever has a model that works uh, <laughs> generates uh, generates high risk adjusted mm -hmm. returns and everything is fine, but you have to be really careful. And I'll, I'm, I'm glad to talk about it a bit later. Yeah, yeah. But just to, um, yeah, for instance, put it into example, recently, the, the, the this red, red period, we had in uh, March, 2020, COVID, right? Slump where 
uh, was the like the fastest bear market ever and uh, uh, markets were losing double digit percentage um, uh, points every day. And uh, uh, this situation was obviously super difficult for any machine learning model to predict because which model can incorporate coronavirus? I mean, <laughs> so uh, uh, that's why it's uh, sometimes it's not actually uh, that's why I mentioned it's 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 difficult to to capture everything, but hopefully I, I'll uh, with my research I'll be able to figure something out. So uh, yeah, uh, the 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 thing what I'm showing you here uh, on the these two slides uh, is actually my first experiment. So this is more uh, still this classic quant analysis because. Uh, what I'm doing is um, enhancing Markov switching regression model, something that a lot of researcher researchers have done. Uh, however, um, in fact, uh, I'm using technical analysis to help myself. Uh, and generally, academics do not really like technical analysis. But in the industry, it is used all the time and a lot of people, institutions find value in it, especially when you blend it, well, use it as a factor in machine learning models. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to enhance those, even when you look at this chart here, this two state Markov switching regression, so just low variance, high variance model with technical analysis so that I would actually be more accurate regarding onset of, the, of every regime and smoother. Because if you even take a look at dot-com bubble here, Markov switching regression told me that, all right, we were in red, but then we are in green again, red, green, red. This is obviously, I don't know, from some short-term trading perspective, could be even maybe useful, but from long-term, Okay, long-term perspective, like what we have in the church, we would rather the model to say it's red all the time and somewhere around here you would tell, all right, it's green, green let's buy. And here it says it's, it's just red, not, not any green, red, green, red, and then here again, green, etc. cetera. Um, that's why actually uh, these enhancement to mark of switching regression popped up uh, such as three state models which would capture the medium variance. So whatever the two state is not sure of, because I bet somewhere around here uh, in, during the dot-com bubble, the, the green period, the probability was possibly around 51%, which is obviously like a toss of a coin almost. And that's why those medium variance, which is added could be treated as some sort of an error. So you disregard the medium variance because the model is not sure of it. And you live with, um, just green and red periods, this is where the model is says, yeah, it's green for sure at 90% probability. But as you can see from this chart, it's pure mess. You have green, yellow, red, yellow. From practical standpoint, nobody would like to look at this model. And actually, um, even the, the papers I, I use say the same story. It's like three state models are not really stable. However, I can spoiler a bit here now. I found that in those three state models are actually doing a pretty good job with commodities, commodity features. So that's worth exploring in the future. So what I wanted to do is to actually, I want to sort of smooth things out with this model. And uh, I just added, well, not maybe just, I added this technical overlay. It's called um, a Kaufman's adapting moving average, which blends volatility and trend component. And thanks to that, I was able to discern actually four states, which, which are also pretty helpful because uh, what this model, for instance, doesn't show you are the transition regimes. So if we're in red, right, we're in red, great, everything panics, red just wait it out. However, when will it stop? Or if it's rising, when things are, got, are about to get a bit shaky, let's say. So those four state um, models, well, the one that I constructed here does it. So it, it for instance, add this yellow 
bullish high variance regime. For instance, you can see it here because the markets have risen enough and here investors were a bit, I don't know, the, the, the models, the, the, the volatility started rising a bit, but it was from technical perspective, still bullish. But here he had this warning signal that, all right, people may actually start to panic a bit. And indeed like peaking is usually about this. People are not sure what to do next. And later, right, we had a slump uh, and then it rose again. Same with bearish low variance, right? So when everything stops panic, panicking, like uh, it's barely visible, but for instance, like here after January, 2018, uh, variants start to go down, people calm, calm, calm themselves, and then the markets rise again. So this is my kind of uh, uh, way to address this problem. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, as you can see here, it's still pretty classic quant stuff. However, I need all that to generate labels for the machine learning algorithm that will be in the next experiment, because if I want to predict something, I need obviously y uh, variable, which in this case are classes of bullish high variance, bullish low variance, bearish high variance, bearish low variance. And obviously these classes need to be accurate because it's not, um, and smooth. It's it, because it's not um, even it, without it, like what, you cannot just do it manually. When do you know when things started or ended? And that's why you need these helpers. And uh, this one, this model maybe would be helpful, but it's not that good as as this one. So uh, um, yeah, this is okay. what I what I did, and uh, and now I'm heading into machine learning. Yeah. Um, okay. So like now that you have the input for your model, speaking of which, are there any like standard machine learning models that are commonly used in the world of finance that? That you might consider using as well yeah sure so um generally from what i what i yeah, do or read uh about you have these three let's call it uh or no it's even four um big say um, specification methods uh that are used in finance so you have this common supervised learning complex, I, I call it, I'm going to explain later, complex supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. And common supervised learning is what I call it is, it's, yeah, that, that's just my names, uh, are, you have, you see three, really three, maybe four models, algorithms, such as random forest, extreme gradient booster, and support vector machine. And pretty much whatever paper you read, book, our authors are either praise one or the other. And well, there's pretty much this no free lunch theory, which says no model is best for everything. That's why you need to juggle. Sometimes random force will be best, sometimes XGB. I find XGB to be the best, but that's myself because one of, uh, one of the best, if not the best book on the market on financial machine learning is all about random forest. So honestly, it depends. Um, then you have this complex supervised learning, which are neural networks. And these are mostly used for asset um, uh, portfolio optimization, uh, usually like feed forward because it's a bit easier. The, the architecture is a bit easier and can handle smaller, relatively smaller sample sizes. Uh, so for instance, not so like you, you have million observations, you may have tens of thousands, for instance. So, um, or even thousands. And you obviously, if you want to do anything with neural networks, you have to go simple. But sometimes you have more uh, long short term memory networks are very common in, in finance. Um, then you have unsupervised learning again for portfolio uh, optimization, such as hierarchical clustering, for instance. And reinforcement learning is, the, I guess, the, not, well, relatively least discovered because obviously you need like huge sample sizes, but there are some nice, uh, what from what I, I actually read a book recently that uh, did like this huge chapter on, on reinforcement learning. How can that be applied in, in finance? And it's pretty interesting and it's, uh, well, pretty good area to, I guess, to explore because it's you pretty much 
have like an agent, like an AI that does the trading for you and learns from it. Uh, but yeah, that's that's actually not that simple to implement. Yeah. So what these, would you think, yeah. sorry, what would you think is like the most difficult aspect of trying to implement machine learning um, in, in specifically in finance? Would it be like um, getting enough data or things like that? Uh, yeah, data, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> That, that's it because uh, even uh, when you when it comes to ima say image recognition text text recognition you just type google repository text or image database you download 10 gigabytes of data and then you just fine tune your model which you especially when it comes to text you already have transformers that are prefit and you just apply it to your data and you end up with 99% out of sample accuracy well, in finance, you have to deal with it yourself. Some, um, you just don't have it. Either you have to buy it from data providers like Bloomberg, DataStream, FactSet, uh, if you really want to have a good model, or some, for instance, banks, hedge funds, they tap into some alternative data sets, uh, like when, same, same, some, some like real-time trading stuff, credit card usage. So they obviously end up with huge databases they, they can um, apply their models for, but that still obviously requires a lot of say cleaning and, and all that mm -hmm. process. But I guess it's it's it, just the data is, is a real problem, um, mm -hmm. especially because you have a limited history. So if you want to have a model that kind of tries to see everything and keeps in memory, whatever happened from at least 90s. Obviously, you have a limited history to, to the 90s, right? So it's not that you can, uh, although that's another story I wanted to say, it's not that you can synthetically generate it, but actually uh, that's kind of a new area of research that maybe may allow it. But uh, that, that, that's generally is the issue. And it's, that, that's the issue for me as well. Okay. And if, if I may, sometimes, even um, I guess uh, you know that certain factor could be important, especially if you do emerging markets, you want to predict emerging markets. But the thing is that certain data that even from like industry perspective, the expert perspective, you know it works, but actually it started to show up, to pop up, to, to be published since 2005 or six. Like usually you have these um, China macro readings that obviously affect it, but they are since 2004 or five. And you kind of have to, you know, lose a lot of years of data to do anything. And that's, that's I guess, that's also another, another so, but yeah, still data. Yeah, so the time essentially, yeah. So yeah. that's really a challenge, but hopefully we'll be able to get over that. And also like, um, there's also something I really want to talk about because I found super interesting was your equity barometer that um, you mentioned previously. And um, so from what I've understood, it kind of gives a reading by combining lots of different factors. So yeah. um, essentially, could you explain what the reading, the final reading itself tells us about the markets? Uh, sure. So this is generally about my work now. Mm -hmm. uh, we move from PhD to, to my work. And uh, equity barometer is just one project. And what it does, we call it equity barometer because of the chart. It's like this, have this barometer. And the, you know, the more overheat it gets, the potentially worse for the markets. But um, what, the, what does it do is to kind of follow this assumption that in finance, it's, it's better to actually have a battery of models than just follow one model. Even if this one model, like machine learning, already includes a lot of factors, obviously, like technical valuations, some macro data, commodities, all that stuff. But it's still just one model. So it's nice to have a group of them together and generate one big signal, such as here, such as equity barometer. And so what, what, what this chart here shows uh, is that the equity barometer is created out of machine learning, technical analysis, valuation, qualitative input parts. And uh, machine learning actually part is made out of long-term model, uh, 
uh, per each uh, region. So we have, so uh, each, uh, sorry, each uh, equity barometer adheres to certain region, either global, US, Europe, or emerging markets. So obviously a machine learning long-term model would adhere to Europe only, for instance, for Europe equity barometer. And the short-term model, which is neural network based, by short-term, uh, here is meant higher frequency data that looks just say a couple of days ahead. Whereas here it's like a quarter ahead weekly data. Um, but in this case, machine learning is just 30%, if I'm calculating properly, 30% of the entire model. Uh, so what this one do is actually takes readings from all of these guys, scale them to zero to 100%, and, uh, and then uh, uh, applies weights to, to those readings. So machine learning is 30%, technical is, um, I think it's 25, valuations is 25, and uh, uh, qualitative is 20 or something like this. Well, generally uh, you, you just have some weights and based on that, again, from zero to 100%, you get the one giant signal. From what we look, if it's um, above 75%, the markets are prone to slumps, whereas below 25, they are prone to rallies. So, um, uh, and interestingly, uh, well, this model, this works, <laughs> we know it, and it has the, it, 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 it pretty much what it does, it, it, it provides this early warning signal. So that if the markets are rallying and suddenly this one says it has readings like 80% for obviously sometimes sometimes could be like entire month. So four readings. And uh, after that, the, the things go bust. But uh, um, uh, so generally uh, what, I, what, I, what I want to clarify um, especially from qualitative input, because that's um, that's important as well. So this part actually includes our own internal expertise. So kind of what we think and whatever we get externally, which includes also other models. So it's like this, that's why it's a huge complex, complex picture uh, because this is purely data, right? But this one is this uh, mind symbiosis. and. That's why it, it I, we believe that's why also it works well because we kind of data sanity checks us and we sanity check the data yeah. and that's why generally that's how generally it it in in our opinion and mind it should work. Uh, so how would you quantify the um, qualitative input? Like, would it be some sort of report that you have to turn into numbers? So uh, generally, the, my 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 boss is responsible for that, and he pretty much takes, uh, say, like external stuff, and whatever he thinks or whatever CIO thinks, and uh, and he puts a, a number to it uh, based on, uh, I believe it's positioning, technical, and uh, uh, Jesus, I forgot. Uh, and some uh, some other third. Oh, it's just model. Sorry, um, mo external models perspective. So it, it's kind of a, I guess it's not really uh, like calculated. It's rather say right external models. We study especially four or five from different investment banks. All of them have higher readings then let's say, then we say, all right, it's like 75 out of 100, right? Positioning, say, hedge funds pretty much moved all their money into equities, risky assets, that also gives pretty high number. Mm -hmm. And uh, same with technical. So technical, actually, this is internal. And by technical, I mean some external opinions or even my boss's opinion. So that also gives a number. So it's like a roughly, rough mm -hmm. number. Uh, it's not really calculated, but that's that's the point of this qualitative input, and that's the idea. You you don't want, really want to calculate anything. You have to kind of want to use your mind a bit to. Mm, so to, like based on like our expertise and like yeah. experience in the field, and, and even based on uh, external research that is uh, mm. quantifiable, let's say, yeah. because you obviously have a model that tracks something, it gives you a number, 
but you still need to kind of process this number in your head and say, all right, that's the that's the value. And uh, uh, and that's why this, this symbiosis is uh, uh, it works for us, at least. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. <laughs> and like now that I guess, are, are you currently using the model in your work? Like, is it a, something that has been proven to, to work in real life, I guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is one of the projects, like I mentioned, okay. and uh, we yeah. uh, keep track of uh, global markets. This is global is, uh, uh, in this case, is this index called MSCI Acqui. So it's like, uh, I think it's around 6,000 stocks. I mean, more than 50% is USA anyway, but obviously you have Japan, uh, China, United Kingdom, Germany, France, biggest economies. And uh, uh, so this equity barometer tries to see where things are globally, but then there is other for just US, for Europe. By Europe, I mean this, uh, again, Europe is a bit blended with Eurozone mm -hmm. and Western Europe in general, because for instance, United Kingdom is a huge market, but it's not Eurozone. So uh, although we, we kind of plan to do this for UK separately as well and emerging markets and, uh, and yes, it uh, it helps us a lot. Uh, we actually managed to do some successful trades because of that. But it's really important. That's why I mentioned in the beginning that the church has huge responsibility. We never bluntly follow models. We we need to kind of combine it with our own consensus. So they are supportive, but they never are like, all right, the model says 80%, let's sell and, and we don't care about anything. No, because we really treat, treat risk seriously because if we lose, then we're not the only one losing. A lot of communities losing are losing as well. And we have some like with generally charities or endowments, the thing is that you need to generate certain rate of return year by year. And if you actually fail, well, that means you cannot distribute some of the money. Some, some, uh, institutions lose, like I mentioned. So that's why it, it, it kind of, even if this model would work 100% of the time, well, never happens, we still wouldn't be allowed to follow it bluntly. So, yeah, especially but, if there's so many implications. And yeah, so uh, we are not a hedge fund. Uh, like, in, in that's why uh, what, what I specialize in is rather using this model for like research. Uh, we have, whereas uh, I like to divide it, the mach financial machine learning into research and trading and trading models, the way I see it are these that actually send you a signal, which is processed by an algorithm and it's like trade upon it. So you don't care actually what's going on. You monitor it, but you rely on it fully. Whereas in research, you kind of see what's going on. You rather follow group of signals, even from one model, and then you try to um, kind of combine it with your consensus. So you kind of think, all right, the model actually makes sense because we think the same. So, uh, all right, let's maybe act on it. Let's see. And this is what we do. And uh, uh, so far it's been helpful because we managed to sometimes cut some losses or like enter the market in the right time uh, when the model says, I think um, these were not present last year. Uh, but we had uh, the, the long-term models, which I'm going to talk about in a bit, uh, for uh, generally globally US and Europe. And they, in um, March, or that was actually in April, beginning of April, they were all like super oversold. They said, all right, this is actually nothing less to, to sell. Uh, it's a good time to actually buy. And this is what we did. And then the markets obviously soared. But generally, uh, uh, just the uh, closing thoughts. Uh, these models uh, are actually more accurate for troughs than peaks, because when things are sold, you actually investor, obviously you want to make money. So when things are completely oversold, then people start to crowd and push the price up. But with peaking, you kind of never know when it's gonna end mm -hmm. because everything may tell you that things are, should end but there is some external catalyst, complete noise that pushes the markets forward. And that's why also kind of the aim of the models like equity barometer is to especially follow the peaks 
uh, which is even more difficult. Uh, yeah, so that's that. Yeah, and also I imagine specifically for the machine learning models, there is some sort of workflow or like um, process. Yeah, exactly, that was what I was going to, that um, you should be following, I guess. Could you explain a bit more about um, the different steps that you go through while creating a working model? Sure, so like uh, in this model, long-term model that goes into machine learning part, it's like that for you, the most interesting <laughs> part is this one. Uh, so uh, in this case, let's talk about uh, emerging market equity barometer and it's long-term emerging market model. And so what this long-term, I call it model does uh, is it tries to predict the probability of emerging market going down or up in the next quarter. So obviously going down means the markets are rallying and what's the probability that in the next quarter actually you'll stop running, just will just go down. Whereas when they are actually going down for a while, what's the probability that in the next quarter they'll actually go up? And so the problem is I'm just using one index, small sample size, because it's a, we have weekly frequency from mid nineties, it's 1,200, 300 observations, which you need to actually, uh, I'm going to add it later, but obviously you need to cut some training and validation data and hold out sample, which means for training and validation, you end up with like, I don't know, a thousand observations or something nice. or a bit more. Uh, so obviously it's not simple, but that's why I don't use by no, all means neural networks or anything like that. I'm trying to actually apply those common models like I mentioned, common supervising models. And actually in this case, it's like stream gradient booster, it was the best. Uh, but let's actually talk since from the beginning. Uh, so yeah, uh, specification, uh, that by meaning probability of market picking or troughing, I mean, this is actually multi-class. So you have like one, 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 then zero minus minus one, one, one. And, uh, so there are actually three labels to predict and the model should discern the positive labels from the noise of zeros. So our things are actually going nowhere. And uh, uh, so it starts with data research. Some stuff we already know, I already know from the expertise, but obviously I'm not the first person that does such a thing. So for instance, I check research we get from investment banks, uh, what they did in this area, whatever prediction they did with emerging markets. Uh, sometimes I make an even call with uh, some team and talk about the emerging markets, what they would, would use. Uh, I brought academic papers, right? Uh, and I gathered, I, well, I gathered data, I gather factors from this knowledge. So it's a bit manual, uh, actually, in this case. Um, unfortunately, I have to just kind of use Bloomberg or data stream and just look for an index, just put it into Excel uh, and, and be done with it. Obviously in, yeah, in say hedge funds, this process is a bit more automated, complicated. You don't, I don't think they even use Excel. They rather you know, use big databases and they tap into, they just stream data automatically. Uh, but we kind of are, are still of uh, a bit old fashioned when it comes to data gathering, but it's also because it's smaller sample size, right? So my extra file is not a couple gigabytes um, uh, heavy, it's a couple megabytes mm -hmm. at least. So once the data is, um, um, is, is gathered, obviously using the, the, the price, uh, the closing price of, of the emerging market in this index, in this case is the MSCI emerging market index. Uh, so using the closing price or the volume, I calculate some technical indicators, which are just um, like um, generally technical indicators, taking these prices uh, that just tell you where the markets, uh, how say overbought or oversold they are. Um, uh, yeah, so that's just pure math. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I put them together. So obviously that, that could end up with like more than a hundred factors, but with models with such a small sample size, I don't, I do not believe 
and not only myself, that more than 100 factors is a good idea. You really need to trim it. And Are there any so you need to. That stand out. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Are there any particular like factors that stand out to you to be quite important when predicting? Um, so that obviously depends on the on the on the market, um, but technicals actually are always there. Uh, after uh, you know, I'm talking about after cross validation. So the the final one that go into the model. So it's like technicals uh, are always there. Um, credit data uh, is is usually there. Uh, so credit by credit, I mean. Uh, for instance, um, uh, yields on on corporate bonds. So how yeah how expensive or cheap corporate bonds are. So whether investors actually uh, wanna wanna buy debt of any company, whether it's high yield, so those are a bit distressed, or investment grade, because it tells you a lot about the economy. So if the investors really like high yield credit, it means there is actually they want to really go risky, and uh, uh, to 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 risky stuff. Uh, uh, which means obviously the things, at least in the beginning, look fine. But when suddenly everyone goes there, obviously uh, the, 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 it means that soon, sooner or later, things are about to go bust. That's why it's a, it's a pretty good predictor, uh, especially when it comes to uh, it, it spreads of, of the credit versus um, uh, government bonds. So if investors actually uh, uh, prefer uh, more and more the, the the corporate bonds over um, over the government bonds the, the the spread will narrow right because the, pretty much the, you pay the same price for the government bond that the, and, and the credit uh, so that's like a factor that tells you all right things will actually may go bust pretty soon and when there is a panic sell off the spreads narrow like everyone sells credit and goes into government. Uh, bonds so that's why it's kind of a one becomes super cheap one becomes more expensive so uh, uh, so that's credit is usually good especially for emerging markets same for emerging markets currencies are um, it's pretty much interconnected uh, because if you want to even buy some emerging market credit bond you need a currency <laughs> so there is more demand for some uh, emerging market currency um, Commodities, oil, gold, uh, some fundamentals. Usually, those are earnings, such as forward earnings. So, whatever analysts think, uh, um, companies on aggregate may earn. Um, yeah, and the rest are pretty much whatever goes in, uh, whatever uh, is is useful. Some sometimes some sentiment indicators uh, like consumer comfort so whether consumers are actually comfortable about the economic environment uh but that, that's kind of can be anything so uh but the, the one i mentioned are pretty common for every market uh i might actually now forgetting something uh but that's what i most remember uh however obviously uh, the so like i said the, the, from this 100 factors you have many different things uh, and um, before you move into the final stuff I talked about in a second, you need to still from this more than 100 trim it to top, I don't know, 15, 20 uh, or 25, just depends, uh, using some sort of feature selection methods. Uh, oh, actually, sorry, I, I went a bit more ahead. Uh, yeah, I, before even doing that, you need to pre-process your data, obviously. You cannot just put everything you just downloaded and use it with a model, uh, especially because financial time series are really non-stationary. A lot of them are. So the, the thing is that, well, they don't repeat. Uh, it's just things are never the same. So uh, you need to scale it, move it to stationary. Uh, for instance, and there are several methods you can do. You, you read about Z-scores, normalization. One actually really interesting method is a thing called fractional differentiation. Uh, is what this one does is it tries to make the series barely stationary so that, because the, the thing is about when you make it from non-stationary stationary, 
so things are kind of repetitive, you obviously lose the memory. So GFC, great financial crash, whatever happened there, looks similar to what, what whatever correction was the five year, five years after, right? Because uh, <laughs> and obviously uh, it's not not the case. Well, GFC was unique. COVID slump is unique. So you need to kind of have the memory of the data to uh, for the model to remember that if something unique like this happened, this was super serious. And that's where fractional differentiation helps you with that because it transforms it using quite complex math. I, I cannot even remember the formulas, but uh, it, 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 it transforms the data to, to make it barely stationary according to, for instance, uh, um, um, adjusted Dickey filler test for unit root or the KPSS for stationarity. And, and that's super, I, I found, I find, I found really uh, uh, the model generally accuracy in the end um, uh, improves. But these are obviously methods uh, proposed by paper, something you kind of need to dig or book. Same with KNN imputer. So, because obviously you'll have some missing values, especially again for emerging markets. And sometimes randomly entire marches or well sorry not entire march because that's a bit of a problem but sometimes some like a single week is gone here and there i don't know why it just happened so it's nice to impute it and instead of moving some using some rolling means or medians not the mean of the entire series you never use the future to impute to the past uh, i find k and n imputer to be useful because it based on the nearest neighbors, it tries to predict the missing value. And um, KNN imputer makes more sense, most sense. And based on a paper, I, I found really useful stuff. Uh, so yeah, this process is also dynamic because you, you, you read something new and you want to use it in your analysis. Uh, so after the cleaning exploration, obviously even yeah, if you use data from Bloomberg, for instance, you, you're a bit more um, con, uh, confident that it's fine, that there are no errors. However, sometimes they do happen even in Bloomberg. So that's why you need to kind of explore it and, um, uh, and then yeah, clean, transform it. Yeah. And once it's done for every single hundred, whatever factor you select uh, before moving into the the final model you select. And you can, I guess you can do it possibly two ways. One way is to just, you do your model with every factor and then you redo it with, sorry, uh, like top 20 or something, whatever, based on the feature importance uh, from the model, from the training sample, a training and validated sample. Um, and then you uh, and then you just redo it and see whether your score improves or not. The other method is to actually uh, use, for instance, random forest to just kind of out of this 100, uh, select your top 20, which you then feed to your final model. Um, uh, I, I, I found this interesting package called uh, Boruta Shap, I think it's called. Uh, it, it is really nice um, feature select selection method that is based on the Shapley values. A Shap, Shap, generally the package called Shap mm -hmm. is getting more and more, um, I guess, used in, in finance due to its feature importance calculation ability. So it's really from both global and local perspective, it tells you what really affects your model. So uh, uh, yeah. I, if you want details, just type SHAP, S-H-A-P in Google. And... It's funny because I was just about to ask about Shapley values. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and I found this nice package called Boruta SHAP. Boruta is, again, Boruta is, uh, is an algorithm for feature selection. And somebody just combined that with Shapley. And that really gives nice results because it permutes. So it really tries to be model, I guess, well, not model agnostic because it uses like random forest, but uh, it really tries to put, you know, different combinations of features. It permutes and calculates Shapley values and then tell you which features based on this whole analysis can be the most, are the most important and 
based on that, you, you feed it to your model. Uh, although it's not time series friendly, I needed to tweak it myself, but uh, uh, it's then again, yeah, it's, 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 it's one way to, to do that. Uh, so yeah, after the features are selected, you, you have to choose your alg algorithm that you're gonna use. And yeah, we talked about this some like XGB random forest SVC. Um, um, sometimes it's, it's actually nice to even use simple linear regression uh, as a naive model, because if you use some random forest that accuracy actually is the same as linear regression that kind of, that's a bit suspicious because a super simple model, linear model does the same job. Uh, could be some issues with the data, you could overfit. You, you need to think about maybe to remove some data, add something new. Uh, there is actually even a score uh, I cannot remember, it just relatively calculates your score versus naive model and tells you how better your model is. Uh, so it's just one benchmark for like how, how good your model is, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty much that's it. I, I, I do not really use this score. I just sometimes mm -hmm. check uh, versus linear model. And I'm happy to see that actually say XGB is way better. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, in this case, in emerging markets case, SGB uh, has turned out to be the best. Obviously, after uh, hyperparameter optimization uh, and proper time series cross-validation. Because again, in time series, you don't use just say K-fold from SK Learn because obviously K fault uses future to validate on the past, right? So it just moves the validation block and takes everything what's what's not the validation block. Uh, you don't do that because that's a huge, that's a serious like leakage issue and your model will overfit. So uh, what you have to do is to kind of, uh, when you split your data into training and validation, you do it block by block. Uh, you don't want to make too many of these blocks, moving blocks. There is a paper about this that's saying you don't want to over cross validate. So you can go with I know, five or less, or less or least. I use even sometimes three. <laughs> and uh, what you do is to start with some training sample. Then you put some gap to avoid any leakage with validation. Then you validate. And that's your first like first score, right? Then you move move forward with it. You start with training here, and again gap validation, and then with the the other one, so that you use different validation blocks, and you see on on your time series, so that you see your model can really generalize, and you kind of use you know uh, for that you use different periods because obviously one period may have been just lucky, the the the, the, the data that the model, the events that the model trained, tried to, tried to predict were actually super easy to predict, but the next validation might have been horrible. I mean, whatever data the model put more weights on are actually, uh, that was a really bad idea. So that's one way uh, to do that. It's called a gap, uh, gap walk forward. Uh, one of the most um, actually, uh, or like purged, walk forward validation, one of the most common in, in finance. Uh, uh, other method is actually, it's called combinate, combinatorial, combinator, different, difficult word. Uh, when, you, when you put actually different combinations of, of these cross-validating blocks. So you, for instance, uh, th this one, just one gap walk forward um, set, is just, uh, well, it's just one set out of three. So other set kind of takes completely different data and train and validate so in, in the same fashion, but it just use different different data. And then another, you know, um, so that you actually, again, try to eliminate the any sort of randomness so that the model just was lucky. Um, and it's an interesting stuff to explore. However, this, combination uh, especially works well with bigger sample sizes because otherwise you kind of try to, you, you end up using the same data. Uh, so it's smaller, like here, I just use gap walk forward. 
uh, to, to cross validate and uh, to optimize hyperparameters. For that, I use I usually work with hyperopt package. And speaking of um, scoring the model, what types what types of metrics do you use? Um, is it just like the traditional F1 scores or do you use additional financial ones? So um, that actually depends uh, on your model. The, if you build a trading model that is focused on making money only, you usually work with financial metrics because the model may be inaccurate from machine learning perspective. The accuracy or F1 score, whatever that is, may be 30%. But actually, when you calculate sharp ratio, which is the um, like risk adjusted return, maybe still high, because if the model is wrong, it's wrong on a small scale. But if it's right, it makes a big box, uh, makes big bucks. So um, that's why accuracy versus financial metrics are not sometimes equal. Um, and, uh, and this is what generally, this is pretty usual in finance. Like you end up with a model with 30% accuracy, but sharp ratio above one, which means if the sharp ratio is above one, you kind of, uh, this is sort of a signal for you to back test, to move forward with this model, at least not to just toss it away. Mm -hmm. And uh, from this research perspective, what I do when, for instance, when I study probability of market picking or troughing, I'm not, I cannot tell how long things will actually go down or go up, right? You just want to have this group of signal that tells you things are about to go bust by at least five or 10%, but you have no idea how long will it take, right? It may be like after GFC, it may take from September, 2008 to I think March, 2009, so like six months or COVID a couple of weeks, that's it. But at least there is a signal that something may go wrong. And for this one, because also I'm kind of interested in like a group of signals. So when I say market peaking over the next quarter, I actually have multiple ones, right? So it's like one, 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 one. And uh, obviously in this case, I want to have the say F1 score, which is uh, usually, uh, or log loss, uh, usually used in finance. And uh, uh, that's why I don't care that much about financial metrics. But if I build some asset allocation model with neural networks, for instance, I just uh, write my custom loss function that for, it's set to adjusted information ratio, whatever. Because I'm care, I care about money, not about you know whether it's accurate or not. Mm -hmm. And in this case of the probability of market picking and troughing, when you have like multiple ones. And obviously it's imbalanced because it's not often that markets especially peak. You need to remember about sample weights, especially, well, especially because the first one is nowhere near as, as important as the last one, right? The model should actually be, the probabilities ideally should actually grow and be really heated just by the end. So when I say it's over the next, like uh, the peak will happen over the next quarter, I want the model to kind of, you know, make more and more clear signal. So obviously you need sample weights, like decaying sample weights to do that. So that the first one is a positive class, fine, but it's great best if the model actually tells me is more accurate by the end than in the beginning. Uh, otherwise you get this weird, sometimes warning, uh, super early warning, and then the model suddenly just tells you, all right, it's actually, it's not that serious and then bang, it, <laughs> everything just uh, goes, uh, goes down. Uh, so that's why when you also calculate scores like F1, you need to remember about putting those sample weights there. Because if the uh, F1 score just does not use any sample weights, it just will tell you some actually may <clears throat> overestimate your score. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's super important in this case. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's, so yeah, lots of techniques, I guess, to to do that. And how long does it take for like, I guess, for you to start um, gathering the data for your model up until like, I guess, back testing when you kind of check uh, how good it is. Uh, all right. Yeah. Actually, good good point to ask this, this question. Honestly, hard to tell because it depends whether 
uh, it starts all with the data. So it depends if the data I gathered is fine or do I need something else? If it's fine, then the modeling will, well, will be satisfactory from the well, back testing perspective from say the checking the holdout set, uh, which is the partial back testing. Um, but it, it, it's honestly difficult to tell. Sometimes it takes just a couple of days to, for me to start everything and to show it to my manager who says, yeah, it makes sense, looks fine. We can just uh, run it for a while to see if actually it reacts well to even new unseen data than holdout. Uh, or sometimes if I work on, for instance, NN stuff, um, which uses larger sample size, when you hyper optimize it, it sometimes takes hours to just optimize it. And then uh, you're not satisfied satisfied with the score. It's uh, just, you clearly see it overfits. So you see, all right, what did I go, what, what I did wrong? Did I actually put, um, although I don't work with like complex architectures, but did I uh, put, maybe I should have put just one layer instead of two, yeah. um, or I should have used some different data. Or I should do some more research and then I ra run it again and um, it can take for like a month <laughs> to end up. So uh, there is not a straightforward answer to that. But honestly, uh, usually it's just around a week, maybe, maybe even less if everything goes right. Uh, uh, sometimes, for instance, I do it and I stumble upon some interesting paper or uh, I am attending a webinar and uh, uh, some like industry expert or researcher just says something interesting and I say, all right, would be nice to use it. So I actually redo everything. Uh, but yeah, it's around, I guess, a couple of days and uh, mm -hmm. it's fine to it really the back testing yeah. stage. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess afterwards, um, as you mentioned, you have to kind of check if it works out in real life. And um, I guess if you can actually use it right. Uh, yeah, indeed. So uh, because checking the model on a holdout performance is, again, from research, this kind of perspective I do, it could be fine. But from trading perspective, it's not fine because simply because the holdout itself might have been just, you know, some period that's not that difficult to predict and the model is perfect. That's why when it comes to these trading models that hedge funds implement, backtesting stage is super thorough. And sometimes it's even an entire team of people working on it. Um, so uh, that's a whole nother story. Uh, in, in my case, what I mean by backtesting is that, for instance, I, uh, yeah, I test it on a holdout. So I, I sometimes create some simple strategies to see whether actually uh, it makes sense or not. I check feature importance um, to see how they look. I do not try to really interfere. Uh, if the model says that this one is the most important, after the mo you know, the score looks nice, the holdout looks nice, the feature says this one is most important, and this is the most important, you, you have nothing to say. Sometimes that's why, I mean, sometimes in banking, you kind of, uh, you meet with this problem that some industry expert, a financial expert sees certain feature. Uh, you, the model looks great, but it's a, the, 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 the expert sees some feature that says, what, what, this one is the most important. I cannot believe something's wrong with the model, redo it. And it's kind of like a data mine until the feature importance looks the way the expert wants it. And that's pretty wrong. That's why actually many hedge funds prefer hiring brilliant data scientists from Apple, Google, Microsoft, who has no idea, who have no idea about finance, but have every idea about da the data and modeling to kind of not have this blurred vision. Uh, I, I can, I'll, I'll talk about it a bit later. My opinion is a bit different, but still I, try, I, I do not interfere. Mm -hmm. And I also kind of taught, even taught, let's call it, uh, my manager to also, you know, trust the features and uh, that I show him. Usually, fortunately, usually it makes sense anyway, uh, but sometimes he sees something and says, 
Oh, that's oh, that's interesting. Well, I guess well maybe, right. but uh, it, it's important not to not to interfere. Um, and for instance, what if there is some false flag? Then again, using say SHAP, I check it locally and see what actually affected this precise signal, and then also I show it to my boss and say, actually, uh, maybe from the data perspective, at this point, the markets should rally or go down. But I don't know, back in the past, like Donald Trump tweeted something and they actually they, they rallied. You cannot predict that using this kind of data uh, because now alternative data sets and alternative, uh, the usage of alternative data sets kind of uh, get more in, more into action, which possibly allow you to see these things. But in this case, you don't. So you kind of say, all right, so technically, if not for, <laughs> to say Donald Trump, or if not for, I don't know, some stuff that happened in politics, uh, the, the markets may actually go down, but because this happened, they did not. So uh, sometimes this false flag actually makes sense uh, but sometimes it just doesn't. And it says, all right, actually model overfits. Let's just try to, do not try to really redo the same thing and count on some randomness that will change things. Uh, that's why, for instance, yeah, I said the, obviously you have to remember about the reproductibility, but you know, I said the random seed to be the same all the time so that any kind of randomness won't affect the model. Um, but like I said, maybe some data, some other kind piece of data should be used, etc. And uh, and then I monitor it. So this is the I guess second part of back the real life back testing, where I just say run a model for a month and just see what happens. Uh, and same story. So there is a sanity check after a signal. Model says something. Why? You check the feature importance. You check whatever happens in the market check, I don't know, our opinion, and you say, all right, actually, well, that's interesting, makes sense, the signal. Or if it doesn't, uh, why it doesn't? Does it overfit? It overfits, back to the <laughs> point one. So um, the starting point. So uh, that's why it's a pretty, uh, you know, it's not that simple. You cannot just do it in one day, you need time uh, to, to do that. Uh, because in the end, even in, in our case, it doesn't really directly affect any decision, but it supports it. So it has to sort of help. <laughs> it has to help. Otherwise, what's the use? Yeah. And especially, I guess, since these models are quite reliant on like um, time series and stuff, I guess once they are being used in real life, you have to retrain them, right? To, to ensure that they're still updated. And if so, how, how often do you do that? Uh, yeah, so uh, if, if you kind of work with these trading models, especially, uh, that they need to uh, incorporate newer data faster. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah, it, it's more frequent. In, in case of this, th these models we have, uh, so it's like once, twice a year, maybe. Uh, we also do not want to do that too often. Um, we kind of rather want to just see how the model reacts on new data for a while. And then uh, I retrain it. Even some, I think it's, uh, I'm not sure. I think European model was retrained like twice. Uh, the rest, the rest was like once. Uh, and, uh, and that's it, it wasn't necessary to do it more than, I actually, met with one opinion that said you, you you should actually do that every like five years because if your model uh, tries to produce some weird signals after a year or so it means it overfits since the beginning i actually don't agree with that simply because the financial world is so dynamic that obviously sometimes it just doesn't capture the new stuff take the retail investor from robin hood the, Reddit stuff that can actually push the market, entire market. Which model could have predicted that from 2017 or something or earlier? Obviously, you need to sort of incorporate new stuff. Sometimes uh, um, 
even if you start working with later with alternative data sets, that's helpful. And that kind of may cause you to even retrain it not that often because this new sentiment factor may, you know, already incorporate that. But if if not, then I mean, still, it's it's dangerous to just keep the ball afloat for so long. You should do it, uh, and and that's it. The model should fine tune to model to newer event. That's why, again, the sample weights uh, they also can be set to sort of treat the past. Even I'm not talking about like next quarter the one one ones, but I'm talking about positive samples from the past, from the dot-com bubble, mm -hmm. maybe they should not be that much important that, than the positive samples from recent history, because the model have to kind of react more on what's recent than one, what's on the past. Obviously that's important, right? Dot-com bubble, whatever happened. But actually what, what happens now is a bit more important. That's why, again, sample weights, these decaying sample weights can, can be useful and then may help your model to react better on the on the new newer events. Would you say there are major risks with um, retraining it too often? Uh, no, no, not too often. Too uh, uh, too um, rare, too rare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Too too often, actually. Uh, no. What what's the harm? Uh, we just we I I. From our perspective, we, we do not do it super often, but uh, obviously, honestly, I attended webinars uh, where uh, you know people who, who do implement a lot of these models into trading, they do it every uh, every month uh, or sometimes even less. Sometimes they retrain it literally after every signal, <laughs> so every day, for instance. To so uh, it, 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 there is no. It, I don't think that too often is wrong, too rare is wrong. Mm, okay. And um, if that's okay, there's also something I'd like to talk about, which is the last one of your projects, um, which is more about natural language processing. Yeah. Because I think like, it's a really growing field right now and um, it would be super interesting to learn about how you use it in your work. Uh, sure, so um, uh, this slide, Pertains to project from my previous job, but now I'm actually working on something uh, similar. Generally, NLP in the finance is used to study sentiment, mm -hmm. whatever the sent that is. Uh, say you you scrape news, you scrape Twitter feed, um, so that you you're really on top of what's going on, and um, that that gives you kind of an an upper hand versus the classic let's call it data like from Bloomberg because everyone has access to it but not everyone has access to good alternative sets which can react to events faster which actually can predict better certain events uh, other use is obviously say um, uh, studying earnings reports management commentary to try to predict whether there is something maybe something wrong with the company in the future um, in this project, uh, we were working on actually analyst reports from the bank and whether the analysts were correct with regards to their forward earnings. Uh, because, well, obviously the analyst prepares a report and said, yeah, in, in my opinion, next year the earnings will go up or something. And if that's true, why? So the NLP study, like the algorithm studied say the summary or like first two lines, like a sequential text. And based on that, try to predict uh, whether uh, the analyst was correct. Because when the new reports flowed in, the, 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 the end product, the algorithm of choice, were able to uh, ease, because it's still, uh, it's published, is uh, able to predict the, uh, well, earnings in the future. So that what if, if you aggregate those predictions, suddenly, especially if the algorithm obviously is, uh, is pretty accurate, suddenly the earnings go down. So that you, you have actually, you're really fast to acknowledge that we are may, may, maybe heading into some sort of a recession. And uh, uh, now I work on more on sentiment. So 
uh, I'm just scraping. Uh, well, actually not scraping because we have now access to this really good uh, news database. And I'm trying to train the model to, uh, to see what, what, what news is positive, negative or neutral. And I'm using, uh, for that I'm using a uh, hugging face transformers package, which contains everything you need. <laughs> Every pretty much very good pre-trained package that you just need to fine tune. Uh, so that's, that's great. Uh, and this one, I mostly worked with Fest AI, uh, which again also contained some um, uh, transformers and it did a lot of stuff for you. So what, what we needed to do was to do some pre-processing, like uh, remove the stop words, uh, the, the basic stuff, but then the package did everything for you to tokenize it. Um, and, uh, and then the, well, the modeling stage was just checking different transformers. I honestly, I cannot even remember what was the final one. Um, I think it was the some, some LSTM, LSTM based algorithm, uh, but not sure what that was. Um, uh, and, and we fine tuned it and uh, then we checked the performance on the holdout set. And, uh, it was um, really, really accurate. But that's because we had a pretty big sample size from all the reports from the Big Bang, so that's not a, not a problem. And uh, obviously, all done on GPU. The the stuff I do, I, I do, for instance, like the emerging markets long term um, uh, model because it uses like thousand or something observations. It's not a much, not a lot you can use CPU for that. It's still super, especially with hyper opt for hyperparameter optimization is super fast, you don't care. But with this stuff, with transformers, you have to work with GPU, otherwise it takes you days to, to do anything. Uh, so that's super important to, to remember about. And, uh, and yeah, the, the, the model is, uh, is uh, uh, it is published. So uh, it went really well. Uh, and, uh, and that's how you pretty much do it in, in finance. Uh, another project, I didn't work on it, uh, uh, but the team I worked with did so, um, was about uh, just reading, uh, I think it was management commentary and predicting whether the company will default next year. Because usually if there is something wrong, the co management commentary is characteristic apparently to that. And uh, the model is really, really nice because it actually is able to, from this text, predict the bankruptcies or, or, or it was like uh, lower credit ratings, for instance, uh, which sometimes is the same because it can be rated to junk, which is as close as bankruptcy pretty much. Um, so yeah, all this stuff in finance, it's all open. You can play around. Yeah. So out of, um, just on a more technical level for the data, pre-processing of those reports. Um, do you receive them in text format or do you have to perform like text recognition on them beforehand? Yeah, so uh, we, we obviously, I mean, maybe, okay, not obviously answer the question. Uh, we, we, we get, you, you get the text. Mm -hmm. So you need to use like tokenizer, the embedding, well, or tokenizer first and then um, embedding to obviously tra transform that into numbers. The algorithm doesn't understand text, but numbers. Uh, so good thing with, especially say like hugging face transformer stuff <laughs> that you use in this case, like tokenizers, which are in fact big preprocessors that work with the specific model of your choice. So they do that stuff for you. And, uh, and it's just a one line of code done. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you need to, uh, you need to obviously transform the text, kind of skim it, like skip through like uh, uh, you know, in like in this case, uh, take care of the stop words, um, embed and um, use the embedding to move from um, uh, text to numbers, and then apply the model. Yeah. But like for the um, text itself, it's not in the PDF or an image where you have to actually. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, no. So. Uh, in both cases, this project, the, the one I'm working now, the all in CSV. Uh, but I think 
the uh, because well, the, the stuff from this slide I worked on, I already got the data, but I think the the, the person I worked with, I'm not sure, but I think he mentioned all that stuff were actually scraped from PDFs first. So there was some algo that was kind of brushing through tons of PDFs and took to took what's important to uh, to to well took the trans transformed it to uh, CSV file. And I think that 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 created some issues because sometimes it made mistakes into like scraping from PDF to CSV. Uh, but I, I honestly can't remember. My I I, for, I, I got the like the ready text. Yeah, uh, so. I guess it's a whole other field of like. So okay. I got it easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Super interesting. And Sometimes yeah. uh, uh, I did also that stuff that I out of um, curiosity I was scraping literally uh, using beautiful soup for instance mm -hmm. tapping onto. Uh, news from websites, which you need to, you know, remove those meta tags, those annoying HTML code, or uh, and and you pre-process it like this first. So that's also kind of um, one way to to treat pre-processing. But yeah, in my case, everything was neat. So <laughs> here, in the case of this project, that's fine. And um, yeah, also like moving on, like on the more general term, I was, yeah, wondering about whether there are any like recent breakthroughs in artificial intelligence um, that would, that particularly interest you or might be relevant to like what you're currently working on. Um, so this area is super dynamic. Uh, things change all the time. I think these, what I consider is quite big breakthrough is possibly generative adversarial networks first published, I think, seven years ago. Um, and their application in finance when it comes to synthetic data generation. I've uh, even UCL did, uh, that was actually co, co written by Professor Philip Trelevan. They uh, did this, uh, wrote this interesting paper on using guns in finance to generate synthetic data and how that affects any strategies, all that. This sort of solves the problem to simplify of smaller sample sizes, right? Because if GAN is able to generate the synthetic data with similar distribution of, distribution of the real data, then you, you can actually um, work with it to, to train your models on. Well, there is this in machine learning, there's this premise of, you know, you train your model on huge synthetic data set and you predict it on real. Uh, so that's one way. And I think that could be really useful in the future to, to handle it. I've, I've even seen some projects um, like uh, uh, correlation GAN. So it's pretty much uh, uh, GAN model, big one that uh, very nicely generates correlation matrix matrices for portfolio optimization problems. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so that's another way to use it. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, uh, that's super interesting and worth exploring and studying in the future. Uh, well, thank you for the tip. And yeah, do you wanna talk about like your future goals and yeah, <laughs> so briefly, uh, obviously finish my PhD, <laughs> which takes priority. I still have a lot to learn. Uh, well, when I attend those webinars and hear really big experts, I feel like I have a lot to learn. <laughs> so, but then again, I also hopefully want to contribute to this topic. Um, and uh, yeah, ideally it would be great to launch my own AI fund, well, my own, but with some other people. This is super difficult, not money-wise, but just because a lot of these AI funds just fail. Uh, I believe it could be because maybe they rely too much on data. They kind of forget that you still need this qualitative symbiosis, even a bit. Mm -hmm. um, that may work. Uh, so yeah, people, 
really you still need to have some knowledge of finance and not just pure data science or uh something. yeah and to 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 use it to kind of sanity checks the model the same way the model sanity checks you and i think um that's why you, the, the kind of people you build this stuff with is important you want you know brilliant data scientists but you also want some really good industry experts that are open to data science and they they the machine learning and finance they understand it and i think this symbiosis can produce a, a successful fund that in the end uh, uh, is able to generate uh, high risk adjusted returns um, although there are institutions such as considered a god among uh, AI funds, um, uh, Renaissance technologies, but that was made by with uh, <laughs> uh, that was fun, funded by geniuses, mathematical geniuses like Jim Simmons. Um, I recommend the book um, to, to a man who sold the market. Uh, I think it's called. Uh, but you know, not everyone is such a pure genius. The, the guy just pretty much took only <laughs> largest math whizzes America had at, the, at that point and created funds that returned uh, on annual basis like 50, 80, 100 wow. percent. So you doubled your investment every. Uh, that's why the people starting, uh, but that, that's about their medallion fund. So just only internal. So that's not for investors. That's what they actually generate for themselves. And that's why when you work that you kind of become a millionaire from the beginning because you you know these things work so so brilliantly and they were the guys who started all this they were using machine learning in the 90s so the stuff that kind of hedge funds started using 10 years ago they were already using it a long time ago natural language processing same um so i don't know what they're using now but we're gonna find out in 10 years possibly <laughs> we'll see uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so these are obviously unique. Same Two Sigma is another amazing fund, Man AHL. Um, uh, but uh, I think uh, if you if you don't have access to such brilliant you know people that change the world of mathematics and and, and computer science, uh, you you kind of need to uh, uh, look for for people that. Uh, for the symbiosis of good modelers, data scientists, and, and industry experts, and that, that can work. And um, unrelated, because I'm interested in astronomy, I would really love to complete some proper astrophysics course that would actually organize my knowledge around it, especially with regards to particle physics, because sometimes I read that and I, I have to you know, trace Wikipedia. What are, what, what are leptons? What that is? I don't understand. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so that's that's unrelated. Would be nice to know, especially that I also read some articles of using, say, artificial intelligence in in astronomy. Super yeah. interesting to say, guess the chemical structure of of a planet, uh, like yeah, or geological structure of a planet. As you just cannot see. You cannot. Yeah, I read like this article a few weeks ago about um, I think detecting um, dark matter and gravitational lenses using AI as well. So brilliant stuff. Yeah. yeah, brilliant stuff. And I think that's really the <laughs> could be the future if the tech cannot catch up and AI man, uh, like the hardware cannot catch up. With AI. So uh, uh, yeah, that could be also great stuff to to do after PhD. <laughs> now I have yeah, more. I mean UCL has a lot of I think astrophysics as well yeah could be could okay, be <laughs> but i'm not sure if they just accept me without any physics <laughs> uh, diploma but yeah uh, we'll see <clears throat> and uh, yeah finally i was just wondering exactly do you have any tips for um anybody who's viewing or um interested in learning more about finance and com like computer science and how they work together uh, yeah, so there are these three that I always uh, give to, to, to like these students or my colleagues, whoever is interested in that. And I say, in fact, if you want to start, you should really learn Python, even though um, you, you can also obviously build 
this model in C++, what's the harm? Yeah? Actually, when you do algorithmic trading based on those signals, you have to, because you have to be super fast. Uh, but Python is the way to do that uh, simply because of the support, enormous support. Honestly, I cannot tell how many things I did not know, or I still sometimes don't know, and I just type it and voila, stock overflow, and I have the answer. Uh, and that's all in Python. Python has all the packages you need. Honest, I for classic quant, I use R because sometimes Python have these packages missing. But honestly, for machine learning, Python is all you need. But it's good to actually learn Python in data science. So sometimes you have these courses that blend those two. So you learn the language but you also learn how to do it in finance uh, in data science or machine learning, not just, you know, Python for beginners and that's it. It's, it's nice to put this knowledge into practice. Uh, so course like on data camp or data quest or whatever data something uh, offer. Uh, another topic point is I believe, but well, that's my opinion, uh, is to explore um, financial topics to better understand the data. And I know, like I mentioned, a lot of people disagree with that because as I mentioned, hedge funds really like hiring Facebook people, <laughs> Google, that have no idea whatsoever and just learn later or uh, actually they get all the data they need. They just need to know what, how to work with it. And they already do because they work for these huge tech corporations. But in my opinion, it's actually good to know anyway if somebody tells you, and uh, yeah, I meet people like this um, who are, are amazing at the modeling stuff they do, but they are actually have huge knowledge of, for instance, currencies. And yeah, what affects currencies? You work with credit, what affects credit spreads? What are credit spreads? Right? So this kind of even basic stuff you can read on Investopedia, Investopedia, uh, but that's super useful to, you know, even understand what, what you work for, what all that means, because sometimes that can even actually help your modeling process. Uh, but you need to be careful not to actually like yeah, blur your vision with that. So if you see some feature that doesn't make it a lot of sense, but your model actually performs very well, then that's the way it is. Um, and number three are these two books which I always recommend to read in this order because the first, the 100 page machine learning book by Andrew Burkhoff is great for people to know what machine learning is in general. And it literally is about a hundred page of synthesized important information from machine learning. So the author does not spend hundred pages on random forest putting formula after formula after formula. It, the author rather puts just one formula and some intuition behind it. What does it mean? How does it work? Couple of paragraphs and you understand everything perfectly, including some Python code. I, for instance, when I read these th things, um, I prefer to understand things from code than sometimes even math formulas, especially if it's too much. I know it's super important, but I kind of, I read the code and I understand things going on better than um, read, read the math. I don't know, it's just how my weird brain works. Some people prefer the other thing. Some people prefer actually books that are just pure math, nothing else. But I think if somebody wants to do the first steps, this, first, this, one, this book is pretty cool because then later you just move on to those more advanced books, which is, you know, it's just math and algebra, nothing else. And after that, the Advances in Financial Machine Learning book is a must know if you want to do it in finance. It's by Marcos Lopez de Prado. It's uh, the most known book in the area. Uh, and uh, it just really tells you how to apply the stuff that you learn even from the first book to finance because it's completely different. And uh, yeah, well, the, the stuff I showed you use a lot of tips from the uh from this uh from this book so that's why it's uh uh it's 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 super important to know and especially that this this book it is complicated but it's not that much because there are i read some stuff that really 
is really too much yeah. and it's more even dedicated to people who really have some even physics background just read one math formula and they don't need any text they just understand everything and for me i don't think i'm not there even yet even after the stuff i built i don't think i'm there even yet to uh, to understand although yeah it's not like i don't understand at all it's just i prefer stuff like this especially stuff that mixes with the code so yeah. this book in finance is uh is a really good way uh to uh to to read a symbiosis of math intuition code theory uh, yeah well thank you so much for sharing those i think it will be really useful especially for like people like maybe students who aren't like finance wizards or aren't super uh, knowledgeable about everything that's happening, but really want to get like get started in, in the field. So um, thank yeah, you very that's much. Super, super uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting. And yeah, just to clarify, a lot of things I mentioned here, it's sort of, um, I cannot speak for everyone because some people may have different approaches. Uh, it's just the, the way I, I learned to do it, I do it and I find it to work. But uh, yeah, uh, some people may disagree. That's why uh, I mentioned that it's all dynamic. Sometimes you find something better and you replace your own way of doing with something different. But anyway, it's a, it's a really interesting topic to explore and uh, uh, it's rewarding in a way that um, it's nice to see that your model in the end, actually correctly predicted the future. Uh, oh, that's the best feeling. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge and expertise with us and for taking the time to speak about the work and everything. And um, I'm very grateful for it. I'm sure everybody who's watching the video will be as well. So sure, yeah, thank huge you. thank you again for doing this. Thank you very much. And yeah, well, um, that was it. So thanks. I'll stop recording now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>